Thank you, Steve, for that introduction. Um, I don't know how practical this is going to be, and I was really impressed to see some of the slides, just intros um, uh, in this class that you have a lot of practical hands-on opportunities uh, under the entrepreneurship uh, programs here at BYU. Uh, I'd like to start out by uh, introducing you to a perspective exercise that I invented with the sole intent to expand my children's minds. I love to go through this exercise with people to help illuminate the value of perspective and also to illustrate the fact that nothing is absolutely 100% understood. This is extremely important and a frame of reference as an entrepreneur that you absolutely have to have. Entrepreneurs can arguably and should question everything to the edge of the known whenever it is both reasonable and possible to do so. I believe that the discovery and bringing to light of those things that were formerly unknown is one of the keys to the progression of humanity. It is so natural as a human being and yet at times so comical how sure we feel about some things that we think we know while we, in reality we haven't asked nearly enough questions and we are oftentimes far from real answers. This exercise is a series of questions and answers these questions are painfully easy to answer in the beginning, and I should let you know that by about question number four or five, you're going to start thinking that I'm either an idiot or I'm an alien. By the, about question number 10, there may be only a few people left in this room who can answer, if any. As I ask you these questions, please feel free to yell out the answers so that everyone else can hear. Please make sure your answers are as specific as possible. Now let's go ahead and get started. What room number are we in? And in what building is this room? And where is the Towner building? And where is the BYU campus? And where's Provo again? Okay, and where's Utah? United States of America, okay, and, and, and where's that? Okay, yeah, nor Northern Hemisphere, Western Hemisphere, both correct answers. Um, and where are the Northern and Western Hemispheres? On planet Earth, okay. And where is that? In the solar system. And where is our solar system? To be more specific, we're in the Orion arm of the Milky Way. But yes, okay, and the Milky Way is made up of over 100 billion to somewhere near one trillion stars. Just trying to keep perspective here. Okay, so where's the Milky Way? Okay, it's definitely in space and it's in this universe. It is within a larger group of galaxies called the local group, which is also in yet an even larger group of galaxies called the Virgo supercluster. And the Virgo supercluster is inside an even larger supercluster called the Laniokea supercluster, which means immeasurable heaven, and is made up of over 100,000 galaxies, each of which are comparable in size at various amounts to, to the uh, Milky Way that we're in, and is over 520 million light years across. And I will ask you not to try to compute that right now. Uh, we don't need any ambulance calls to this room. So at which point I ask, where is the Linnaea supercluster? And the answer is, nobody knows. It is somewhere near another supercluster called the Perseus Pisces, but the truth is, we don't even exactly know where we are in the universe. And so with my kids, then I say, so you're saying you don't know right where you are right now? And they're like, okay, I guess so, Dad. But the funny thing is they were so sure about where they were just five minutes before. This illustration exercise gives you a couple points to, to consider. One of which is that you don't know where you are right now and that exploring deeper leads to better perspective. And that better perspective creates meaning and meaning creates purpose. purpose comes, with purpose comes motivation and motivation gets things done. And if you combine motivation with perspective, you will get the right things done. But here's the kicker. You will love doing it. While it is arguably not important for you to know exactly where in the universe you actually are right now, it is incredibly important for your entrepreneurial pursuits 
that each of you individually know where you are going, but what is far more critical for you to understand is why. Understanding why you want to succeed is far more important than identifying what you are going to do. The what becomes much easier to identify once you understand the why. If you don't know your why, you're not alone. Most people I know have no idea what the why is in their lives. Finding your why is worth taking as much time as is needed to figure it out. Your why isn't to make a lot of money. I promise you that money will not be enough motivation for you to achieve true greatness. In addition, it is very dangerous to be motivated by money because in and of itself, it is truly directionless. With money as your motivator, you will allow compromised thinking within yourself and within others around you. Those compromises will inevitably lead to poor business ethics. Your motivation must be much deeper than money. The process of identifying your why can take weeks or months and involves a lot of soul searching and questioning. A couple of simple things that you might want to try is to ask yourself how you would like others to think of you long after you've grown old and died. Another is to ask yourself if you could change the world in just one way, what would that way be? Be creative and in the process you'll identify your engine, your motivation your driving force that will keep you afloat during the inevitable dark days which come to all entrepreneurs at one point or another. More on that a little later. Finding your why is no small matter to be trifled with. Nothing can stand in the way of a man or a woman who knows why they want to accomplish great things. No single thing will motivate you better or your employees more than your clarity on your why. Simon Sinek wrote a great book called Start With Why to help you understand and walk through the process of identifying your personal why. If you can find your why, you'll find your engine and your motivation. Once found, keep that why front and center in your mind at all times. It will carry you through the great times and the bad. I don't want to talk you out of becoming an entrepreneur. No, I take that back. I do want to talk you out of becoming an entrepreneur. That is, if you, that if you don't have what it takes and you aren't willing to sacrifice enough, then you'll definitely be a lot better off working for someone who does have what it takes or a large corporation that will metaphorically keep you safe and warm. I don't mean that in any kind of condescending or demeaning way. I say that for your own protection and for the protection of your future spouse and their sanity. There's a lot of glamour associated with living the American dream of entrepreneurship. And there's an external perception or appearance of overnight success. Before I get into these details of what I believe the anatomy of an entrepreneur is, let me tell you the story about myself to illustrate. Everyone loves a good failure story. However, we never want the story to end that way. But a good, solid, metaphorical face plant or two along the way is par for the course in life, especially for an entrepreneur. My story, story, my story starts with getting married, starting my first full-time job, and starting full-time school all in the same week in the year 2000. I worked in the field of network and systems administration. And I enjoyed this line of work, but I wasn't feeling the passion, and therefore wasn't fully applying myself. I had seen people repeatedly change careers, causing them to effectively start over and over, and I didn't want to go down that path. So regardless of the fact that I didn't have an incredible passion for network administration, I was planning on sticking it out with a career anyway. A good friend of mine, Josh Brown, who helped me get into the systems administration field to begin with, approached me in late 2002 and asked me if I would go up and visit with a small business owner friend of his in Salt Lake City who needed some help with some internet marketing on his e-commerce business. Since I didn't want to jump careers and I had failed an attempt at e-commerce in the late 1990s just after high school, I blew off the request until January of 2003 when Josh put pressure on me by saying, hey, I thought you could figure it out. And he would always joke with me about how I would dredge the trenches of the internet to get to the bottom of things. Eventually, after some more prodding, I broke down and I drove up to Salt Lake City to meet with his, his buddy. When I walked into his office, I explained that I didn't know internet marketing and that I believed I could figure it out. He responded by saying something like, you don't know internet marketing, and I don't know you from a hole in the ground, so have a nice day. 
At which point I turned around feeling like, oh my gosh, what, what am I doing up here? What, how did this happen to me? And I start walking for the office door. But before I got to the door, or about the time I reached the threshold, something clicked inside my head and I thought, I'm not going down this way. And this is not this, how this story ends. So I turned and basically said, I'm going to come in here. I'm going to make you a ton of money, at which point we are going to negotiate a reasonable salary. And in the meantime, I'm going to work for free. To that, he said, I'll see you on Monday. <laughs> at the time, I was going to school in the evenings and was working nights and weekends, uh, doing three shifts of about 13 to 14 hours each. So I'd have free time during the week to work full time as well. So within 30 days, I had tripled his revenue. and using just simple traditional, now traditional internet marketing tactics, PPC, some SEO. But I knew I discovered something that I loved. The internet marketing used numerical comp computational portions of my mind, and as well as the English psychology side. So at which point I negotiated a great salary for the time and for my experience level and began uh, rocking and rolling from there. By the end of 2003, in a very quick fashion, I dropped out of school, ditched both the day job and the night job so that I could do this internet marketing stuff on my own from my garage. I was doing a few things ranging from freelance consulting work, e-commerce, some PPC affiliate driven uh, websites, and my favorite of all, the old infamous AdSense arbitrage, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. At the time, AdSense made up most of my revenue. Essentially, what I was doing was buying traffic from smaller pay-per-click networks, Okay, yeah, that's actually part of this, but that's okay, no worries. Um, essentially, arbitrage is buy clicks low, sell clicks high. So I would buy them off of these second tier networks, find what, seven search, canoodle, a bunch of these don't exist anymore, and uh, would sell that traffic to Google AdWords through the AdSense program. So um, I hired freelance risers to write the content for my websites. And I wasn't so much as even proofreading the content before publishing it. I'm pretty sure the quality was pretty low and I didn't even care. These websites were not designed to provide any substantial value to anybody, let alone the consumer. I was interested in spending this much and making that much. That's what mattered to me. At that point in my life, I was working out of my garage and would do anything that made more money than it cost to generate it. I really didn't care about whether or not I was in any way providing value to any of the parties involved, as long as I was getting paid. I would push the infamous and evil payday loans as long as I spent less than I made, I was happy with it. And in a, case, and in a state of stagnation, I spent the next three or four years of my life. I wasn't growing personally and I wasn't growing professionally, I wasn't stretching myself in any way. This went on until early 2007, when doing my 2006 taxes, I realized that I made so much money that I had to sell my house here in Provo to pay my tax liability. I joked with my wife about moving to Iceland, to which she unilaterally shut that idea down. Um, so I got her to move down to Ephraim instead, a little further away from the metro area. I thought, hey, I'm on the internet. I can do anything. We can live anywhere. Uh, what does it matter? At that time, we were in the heart of the Great Recession. And companies were beginning to look at their bottom lines a lot more. Google was no different. They had started cutting off these AdSense arbitragers, and I had survived the first couple of waves of cutoffs. But in August of 2007, my bad karma caught up to me. I went to log into my Google account, and they had shut me down. They would rolled up everything and turned it off. Unfortunately for me, at that portion of my business was made up of over 90% AdSense arbitrage. The remaining 10% was some affiliate things through Commission Junction and some other affiliate networks. Over the coming year and a half, I battled, I struggled, and I fought to try to resurrect some form of this hack from the good old days using my same old bag of tricks and hacks that I had used before. During that time, I burned through all of my cash savings and sold everything that I owned of substantial value, trying to resurrect the good old days. By now, it's early 2008, and I spent tens of thousands of dollars off of credit cards trying to get things going again. And when I failed, I turned to friends and borrowed tens of thousands of dollars from them. Burn that up. Nothing still. Just some things would kick on for a minute, start working. I'm like, yeah, I'm back. Wah! 
and they would just fall apart because I wasn't creating real value to humanity. Well, it gets worse. At that point, I turned to family and borrowed tens of thousands of dollars from them. By August of 2008, I couldn't keep my marketing going and keep my credit card payments at bay. So I stopped paying the credit cards. Then I started experimenting with some other things, like I converted a Chevy S10 pickup into an all-electric vehicle, which after blowing through thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars trying to perfect that system and get it running, I ended up selling it for a small fraction of my investment. By late 2008, I sunk into a really, really dark place where all I did was eat, sleep, play video games, and watch Star Trek reruns. And that went on for about a month, maybe two months. The lights were still on in the house, and there was food in the fridge, but we were running on fumes. My financial state was so incredibly dreadful that I was in talks with a bankruptcy attorney. More on that later. <sighs> then the unthinkable. I realized there was no coming back from this place and that I had run out of resources, and so I knew I had to go and get a job. <sighs> I had to start looking, and uh, for me uh, and many other entrepreneurs, Getting a job can be viewed as a mark of complete failure, though I don't believe it is now. After poring over job listings, there was only one that stood out to me. It was for a marketing company called One on One Marketing. The job listing written by Mark Brown said something to the effect of, do you know your stuff or not? If you do, you need to call us. It just clicked with me. I knew I had to apply there. I didn't apply anywhere else. I didn't attempt to interview at any other companies. And after about six weeks of interviewing and uh, Four different interviews. I had an interview with Nick Greer, which I th sounds like many of you are familiar with here. And uh, I tried to pitch him on letting me work for free. I even tried to get 1% of his company working for free. He would have nothing to do with that. Um, and uh, it was preposterous that I would have pitched working for free for him anyway at that point because I was absolutely dead broke and owed an incredible amount of money to a lot of people. I probably came off a little edgy, but Nick saw something in me and he, he pulled me in. I was commuting from Ephraim every day up to American Fork, and the drive was about an hour and a half each way, except for when there were heavy traffic or inclement weather. At one point, I remember driving, I think, almost four hours each way because of uh, heavy Utah snows. Needless to say, I had plenty of time to think. Some mornings, I would cry myself to work. I wanted so badly to be back out on my own again. I determined at that point and, in that po and at that time that I wanted to create value for humanity, and I didn't care if I didn't make much money doing it. I wanted to be able to go to bed at night and know that when I woke up every morning, I was doing something good. And that even if what I was doing didn't work out anymore, I would know that I had helped humanity in the meantime. I didn't want to live in the cortisol fear that drove me all those years before in my garage. Unfortunately, after being in, even after being employed at 101, my finances were so bad that I found myself sitting in the office of a bankruptcy attorney with my wife sitting next to me. He had prepared all the papers and he was ready for us to sign. But something clicked in my head and I wasn't going to have it. I wanted to pay back my debts. So to the attorney's chagrin, my wife and I stood up and walked out of his office. That first year with 101 Marketing was a tremendous one. The timing could not have been better for the for-profit education space. The recession was in full swing and education lead gen growth was explosive. It was the perfect storm. I oversaw all the creation of the PPC strategy and the, built the teams to execute on paid search, display text, and some image ad media buying. The combination drove revenue up dramatically for Nick Greer's one-on-one -on -one marketing and Nick was very good to me. The company was flying high and I was flying high with them, but I started feeling the itch. I think you know what itch I'm talking about. It was early 2011, and just a few months earlier, I had moved up to Pleasant Grove from the middle of nowhere, Ephraim, to be closer to one-on-one's American Fork offices. It had been about two years of rocking the revenue doors off at one-on-one, and I was ready to try my hand at business again. I had paid back most of my debts and saved not quite a month's worth of living expenses, so naturally I was ready to get out on my own again. <laughs> I couldn't live with the idea that I had totally failed in business on my own, and I learned an incredible amount from one-on-one -on -one and about business and how it should be done and how I thought it might be able to be done better. After moving up to Pleasant Grove, Utah, in the midst of the Silicon Slopes, I met Paul Adams. When I asked him what he did for a living, he described his skill set as conversion rate optimization by designing highly converting websites. 
my mind lit up. I knew I could drive optimis I knew I could drive traffic and Paul could design websites that would convert consumers into leads or sales. All we had to do then was to load up on clients and we could both do sales. I knew he was going to be my business partner at that moment. The plan was to scale up the agency and use the freelance work that Paul was already doing in his basement to be able to fund the operation to build a full-blown lead aggregation company and move from lead generation to technology. Right now, Skyrocket is in the phase of moving into technology generation. The reason I shared this business personal story with you was to highlight that entrepreneurship is often not, more often than not, includes some significant failure. This is something that you mentally need to be be prepared for and something you'll want to discuss with your spouse or your future spouse. You'll want to take some time to determine what your limits are. In other words, make a choice as to how bad you'll let it get before you'll abandon ship and go get a job. This is the unpleasant side of entrepreneurship, but it is a smart thing to do to prepare for a little bit of the worst case scenarios. You might be thinking this guy face planted pretty hard, but I'm not going to do that. The good news is, is that you think that way. The bad news is, you're probably wrong. According to Forbes, 90% of startups fail. If you still don't feel determined or deterred because you don't think those odds matter or apply to you, then great. Because arguably, you couldn't be considered an entrepreneur if you were deterred by mere statistics. No one starts a business with the intention of failing. And with that in mind, I would like to, you to consider a few practical concepts that could keep you in that 10% that do succeed. Know thyself. Beyond the entrepreneur's unstoppable desire to succeed, if I were to sum up in its entirety, being an entrepreneur is one skill, the ability to know thyself. Remember my story where I, where I partnered with Paul? Did you catch my commentary about how his skills were complementary to mine? What I didn't tell you is that I had tried to start another business or a year or so before with someone who had nearly the same skill set as myself. We failed. With this in mind, you'll want to take an honest inventory of two things. Number one, what are you great at? Write the list down. What you love, write that list down. And then what are you terrible at? Or what do you hate to do? After completing this simple exercise, you'll be looking at a list of two things. One represents the foundational components of your startup that you'll be able to cover. And the second is a list of things that you'll need some help with. Whether your help comes in the form of mentors, business partners, or employees, it is up to you to decide. This is not just important, this is critical. In the beginning, you personally represent every single department of your startup. Accounting, marketing, product design, assuming you're business idea needs those roles filled. Yeah, what business doesn't need accounting? I don't want to do it. Uh, I don't know it. Um, then you'll know where you need to start looking for the right talent. Hopefully selling your idea is something that you're really, really good at because you'll never get off the ground if, it, if you're not. If you try to go at it without considering where you are and where you might need help, you're almost certain to become part of the 90% failure stat. Remember, the odds are against you, so everything you can do to increase those odds, the better. This isn't to say that you can't hack your way into doing some of those things that you're weak at. I plunged the toilets and vacuumed the floors at Skyrocket in the early days. But you must certainly realize that no great business is a solo venture. You should not only understand the idea of bringing in outside complementary skill sets, but you should embrace it. If you're worried about diluting your ownership, Remember that it's better to have a small piece of a big pie that's awesome than an entire pie of a nowhere business. At Skyrocket, we have only three core values. We're going to talk about core values because they are your guiding star. They're part of your why. We only do three because they're easy to remember. Uh, someone was like, hey, but Zappos has like nine. I'm like, let's call them right now and see if any one of those people on the phone can quote them all to us. Every time, we got three. So I thought, let's just try to sum up everything in a three. Um, so jumping in, we started with be good, create value. It's so simple, yet so core to who we are. 
that we are constantly seeking as individuals and collectively as a company to generate more value to everyone we influence, from our partners to our consumers, including our own selves. We truly attempt to create a balanced business ecosystem, and it permeates our every thought and action. This is being good and creating value. Next, outthink, outdo. We believe that, we, that when we take more time to critically think through concepts and ideas by asking ourselves and each other the tough questions that don't always paint our own ideas in a good light, that we end up with better outcomes. Then we go and get to the doing part. We work with a fire that drives us from within and generate results that are far greater than our competitors. This is outthink, outdo. And finally, keep your eye on the why. At Skyrocket, we empower the world. We do this by giving people access to clear, relevant, and unbiased truth. With this in mind, we have simplicity and clarity in our business model. We avoid things that fall outside of this. Nothing will break your business faster than a lack of focus. Yes, you must be able to pivot and at times make changes to your business and even your business model. But more often than not, distraction will come disguised as opportunity and your unwavering focus on the why will prevent this from happening. And as a final note, let's talk about ideas versus results. Amazing theoretical ideas, no matter how practical or how wonderful they sound, are worth exactly jack squat. Did that work? OK, all right, all right. Um, and that is until they have been translated out of your head and into the real world. The best thing you can do to distinguish yourself from the entrepreneurs is to get your idea converted into a functioning product, prototype, product, or business as fast as you can. With that in mind, I offer you the four final points of advice. Do not worry about the appearance of success. Spend your own money on your own ideas first before asking anybody else to spend theirs. Let your product or business performance do the talking, and then when you talk, people will listen. And number four, more important than anything, do something now, do something great, and do not be afraid to fail. Yeah, yeah, so that wasn't very practical, so if you have a lot of practical questions or if you have ideological questions, I'm open for, for either one. I also have a list of questions <laughs> provided to me, so we can get into some of those as well. But um, you guys, this is your chance. I'm doing it. I'm living so it right now. I've got a question. Um, during the dark days, did you ever fear... You might live in a van down by the river. <laughs> I almost did live in a van down by the river. But how, how did your wife feel during those times? You know, um, truthfully, I brought up the point about spouses because it is a very legitimate point. When she married me, she knew I didn't have a job, so she knew what she was getting into. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just I, I advise strong, frank conversations. And again, like I said earlier, Determine where your boundaries are. Um, if I could go back, I would definitely set some different boundaries and not sink myself. I mean, I broke every financial rule the Dave Ramsey course has, right? I, you, you, but, you know, sometimes that's par for the course as an entrepreneur. Again, can't recommend it, though, right? Yeah. So, but she supported you through all of this. Absolutely. She knew ahead of time what she was getting into, and she was okay with this, even though it wasn't fun. Yeah, we tighten down budgets, and you know, I'm so, I'm liquidating furniture. I'm like, oh, I love this gold piece. Ah. You know, eBay. You know, everything gone. So. So, typically, when you have a great, grandiose idea in your mind, you think, oh, I got to go grab a bunch of money to, to execute on it. If you give a little bit of time and thought to, and some critical thinking, you can almost always pare the idea down to a small subset. Again, I mentioned the word prototype for a reason. You can usually find a way to very cheaply build some small fragment. Um, for example, I know a company that proved 
a market in just a couple of cities and then went to investors and said, hey, I can replicate these two cities in concept, the success here, across the country, and therefore picked up a multi-million dollar valuation and got a bunch of money. So find a way to prove the concept. It's easier to sell something than an idea. Uh, I did think we would grow that much, but no, it wasn't a goal like the ink. That was just something this year we did for some PR, and uh, it's been great. But yeah, that first year we did $140,000 in revenue. You have to at least hit 100000 to make the cutoff for ink. Did you find that your why changed as you went from you know, different positions, different careers, where you were kind of at that point where you felt like you were in a dark place and you felt like you didn't have a why? Or yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, it's not like I went through that period of time with a why. I wouldn't have done some of the things I did if I had a proper why in place. The why is a process. It's a self-discovery process. Um, and the sooner you get started on that, the better. Uh, I promise you, just the money is not going to motivate you. So why are you personally invested in, in the PPC space, digital advertising? Why is that important to you? Why do you feel like that? Uh, how does that keep you going? So it's not the marketing channels themselves that keep us going. Uh, it's the concept of what we do with that traffic. Um, super brief explanation. We build review sites that have a public algorithm so that you as a consumer can go see what percentage weights we place on what criteria. And so you know why we've ranked the companies where we've ranked them. We have an objective review, and then we allow consumers to come in and sound off about the company. We have a moderation process that tries to filter against, um, you know, nefarious com competitors trying to, or, or companies themselves trying to sandbag and push their scores up and down. So we've, we've created a platform to help consumers make better choices, essentially. And now we're just scaling that up. All right, great question. I will say that uh, um, once you've lived even a part of the dream, it's very rare to, to go back. At least from my experience, it's like a, a you know, I, I was a wild horse at one point, and I don't want to bridle on me anymore. Um, you know, and, and I, like I said uh, earlier, I I didn't know if I was going to be able to succeed on my own. I knew I could. Uh, totally, tremendously build within somebody else's infrastructure, in this case, Nick's, uh, Nick Greer's, but I, want, I needed to know for myself. So that was a driver. How are you finding ways to continually innovate? Or when you started Skyrocket, how, did you, how confident were you that what you had in mind was 10 times better than the next thing? Because that's kind of the rule of thumb, right? You got to be 10, 10 times better to, to really get a company off the ground. Yeah. I don't, I don't follow rules of thumb. Um, I'll, I'll be straight up with you. Like, you'll likely have a lot more success starting something more traditional than to go, tr go wild hair, crazy idea that you have no idea if there's a market for and just something you thought of late one night when you were having a conversation with a buddy. Um, you know what I mean? Like, I, I definitely say that if you have an option to go practical and you can start a real practical business, there's all sorts of skills that you learn there that will apply to the wild hair entrepreneurial stuff. I even strongly advise to go and work for somebody else for a little while, see what you like about how they run the business, uh, you know, volunteer to do as much extra work as you can, you know, get a taste of accounting, get a taste of operations, get a taste of sales, and uh, that would that'll give you a lot better uh, foundation to work off of. But there's nothing wrong for going right for the stars out of the gate. I don't want to say. Anything against that? In those moments where you were in your boss's office or in the lawyer's office and something just clicked for you, how did you develop that mentality or do you feel like that just came naturally to you to react like that? Um, as an entrepreneur, you'll develop a keener sense for opportunity. And it does take some time to do that. 
I practiced those skills in really simple forms. Like in the early days, I would go to DI and I'd be standing there to be like, whoa, those are solar lanterns. Nobody has those. They're five bucks a box. I don't have a mobile device that has internet because nobody does. I'm buying every single one of them and I'll find out later. And I made thousands of dollars. You know, but you know, it goes, it goes both ways. There's definitely bad learnings too. I'll buy the whole pile of crap. It's gonna be worth a ton. Um, yeah, so it's something you want to work through in your mind, critical thinking. Taking advantage of critical moments in your life is something that uh, is worth thinking about before the opportunity arises. I think quite often people pass opportunities up. They don't even know were opportunities because they weren't aware and thinking in that way. Um, yeah, so when I started working with Paul, he had some clients already, but I told him I didn't want to make any money off of his existing clients. I wanted to, to help him bring in a new client. And so uh, we had a, he had a, I'm trying to think how I can say this in 30 seconds. Um, essentially, I helped him sell a new client, you know, a lot of work, a lot of back and forth, a lot of discussions. It was a fairly large pay-per-click account. Uh, we focused on larger $100,000 plus accounts, so they took a little bit more nurturing. But I had a, you know, at that point, a you know, 10-year background in pay-per-click, so uh, yeah, I was executing on the contracts we were closing in the early days, at least on the the media buying sides and such. Did that answer that question? Okay. Um, you know, we we fired up some pretty unique campaigns in the early days we realized that people were getting their AdWords accounts frozen by Google. And so we would uh, bid on those keywords that people were seeing inside their AdWords account. So we were the only company doing it at the time. And so they'd call us like, I can't get into my AdWords. But thankfully, we have great relationships with Google. We'll help you out. But anyway, so all right. All right. Um, so uh, let's thank Jeff one more time.